This is SSN. Story Studio Network. I'm Tom Hoppy, and I'm your host of the most painful podcast. With so many veterans and family members suffering from chronic pain, how does sex and gender impact the research, assessment, and treatment of chronic pain? Today, I'm joined by Dr. Stacy Ritz from McMaster's University to discuss this topic. Welcome to the show, Stacy. Thanks, Tom. Before we get into the conversation, I just want to let our guests know that we'll have an announcement for a gift at the end of the show, so please stay tuned. Okay, Stacy, can you explain to me how sex and gender can impact chronic pain? Well, I can try. It's certainly a, a very complicated nexus of uh, a lot of factors that are associated with sex and gender and the way that they can all play together and intersect with one another and influence one another to affect the experience of pain. I mean, I think to, as you you and your listeners probably are very well aware, one of the one of the interesting and complex things about pain is that it is a very subjective experience. It's very much colored by the individual's personal history with pain, by their own neurobiology, by the social context in which they exist. One of the most challenging issues in pain research is about how do we even measure pain when we know that the experience of pain itself shifts so substantially between individuals and in different times and different contexts. And so because pain itself is so hard to stick a pin in, um, to, 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 so to speak, then trying to evaluate how something as complex as the factors associated with sex and gender can influence pain is itself a very complicated and interesting interplay of a lot of different things. Can I start by talking a little bit about what I mean by sex and gender? Yeah, I think that would be good because there's probably different definitions out there. So maybe a baseline would be, that'd be perfect. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So this is an area I've been working in, in my research for the last probably 15 or 20 years, that's become a, a more and more prominent area of my work. And I first became interested in sex and gender and how they influence health when I was a student and thinking about how I could try and account for the impact of sex and gender in my research. One of the big shifts in the last 20, 25 years or so in the field has been about more carefully defining and more carefully thinking about what we mean by sex and gender per se. The sort of very simplest way of distinguishing between sex and gender is to say something like sex is biology and gender is social. For many years, and actually even continuing now in many different contexts, the words sex and gender are sometimes used interchangeably as if they mean the same thing. And in fact, sometimes I think sometimes people use the word gender instead of the word sex because it doesn't have the same connotations about sexuality. And so it sometimes feels more comfortable for people to use gender. But in, in a lot of fields, we have been distinguishing between these concepts using the word sex when we're trying to talk about things related to biology and using gender when we're trying to talk about things related to the social context. An interesting thing for me as an educator in this area and a researcher is that I would say in the last five to 10 years, given the increasing uh, recognition of trans people and gender non-binary people in society, uh, I would say there's been a shift to thinking about gender as just thinking about gender identity, about, about one's own self, sense of self as, as male or female or uh, non-binary or some other uh, relationship to masculinity and femininity. Uh, when I'm talking about gender, though, I'm talking about much more than just one's own sense of gender identity. Uh, we can also think about gender in terms of the gendered norms and expectations in a given society and in a given culture about what we expect of men and women, what we associate with masculinity and femininity, what's appropriate, what kinds of behaviors people engage in, the acceptability of certain kinds of emotions, for example. Then, of course, there's all kinds of other gendered structures in our society around gendered roles in the home, gendered roles in the family, gendered occupations, and gendered activities that don't necessarily fit into occupations or, or domestic activities, but the kinds of activities people engage in, and then just larger social structures that are heavily influenced by gender. So 
we're not just simply talking about the concerns related to trans people and gender non-binary people, although those are an important consideration in this area as well. We're thinking about how these expectations and structures uh, affect everybody. So that's when we're talking about sex and gender, those are the kinds of things that we are considering. And everything from the genetic, molecular, cellular level, all the way up through our individual encounters and discussions with one another and with the healthcare system to our environments, our workplaces, our communities, all of these things can have an important influence on our risk for chronic pain, on our experience of chronic pain, on the kinds of ways that we'll be treated in the healthcare system for people with chronic pain and the way we understand our own experiences of pain and manifest those in the world. So it's a, it's a hugely complex and I think fascinating nexus of stuff to think about. So this is the biopsychosocial model in a sense you're talking about. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, then, and then the sex and, sex and gender and identity is is a piece into that. And I know with uh, yeah. with veterans, we, you know, we we've talked, we had a past show on identity and culture where the military culture is mission first, self last, you know, which is when you're suffering with chronic pain is, is a challenge. And they also struggle with identity when they leave because they don't realize that they've changed in service. And so now you're, you put an extra layer onto that and we mean an extra layer, it's probably always been there, but now we're talking about it, right? Is the, the sex and gender. Well, I, I find it really interesting and, and been uh, an education for me in the last year or so working with researchers who are doing work on veterans and, and experiencing chronic pain and thinking about how norms of gender are inflected in particular ways and twisted and, and changed in particular ways in military context that are sort of different from what a lot of people might experience. Can you give an example on how that? Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. So for example, when we think about norms of masculinity and femininity and pain, you know, in, in a general context, norms of masculinity that most social structures reward and support are, are about toughness and stoicism and, and being able to handle a lot of pain. And those are traits and characteristics that we associate often with masculinity and reward people for fulfilling. And so that sense of needing to be tough uh, and needing to display a certain amount of toughness can lead people who are trying to fulfill those ideas of masculinity to downplay the amount of pain that they're experiencing or to try and push through and continue an activity in spite of it causing them pain, which can put them at risk for further injury. And a lot of the research that's been done on pain and gender thinks about it in, in that way. And that, that that helps to explain in a lot of in a lot of contexts why men and people who are trying to fulfill those masculine ideals are often at higher risk for certain kinds of injury and that sort of thing. What what has been very interesting to me in working with researchers who are who are thinking about issues of veterans is that in some ways that can be almost flipped on its head in a military context where female military members where in, in a non-military context where there may be more latitude to uh, express pain and to step back from, from those expectations. In a military context, th th they may experience a heightened level of, of demand to, to prove their toughness, to prove that they belong in this environment, to prove that they can handle it. Uh, and so that, that what we normally see as a risk factor for, uh, for men can actually become a risk factor, a higher risk factor for women under under those circumstances where they where they're feeling this extra pressure to prove their toughness that they might not in, in other social contexts. Yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, I think back to my time in the service and, you know, on our tour, we had uh, females, of course, in the combat arms. It was one of the very first uh, at that time. Yes, they do, I would suggest, have a, a challenge or have to prove themselves uh, or feel that they have to do, I should say. Yeah. But then they also have the same kind of culture training that everybody else has, which is mission first, self last. And and mission first, I think, is, you know, it's not just about, you know, trying to push through a soccer game. It's if you stop in the battle, it's gonna be may not have a good turnout. Yeah. So that's kind of the mentality people go in with. So as you what you're saying is it adds that just adds that extra complexity to someone who has to try to prove that they're tougher than than their male counterparts. Or or as tough, or at least 
tougher than people think they are. <laughs> so when you look at the research of chronic pain, that how does sex and gender come into into play with that? Yeah. So uh, a lot of times research in pain, I mean, uh, in research in a lot of health fields in the last 40 years has really increasingly taken an interest in trying to account for the impact of sex and gender in, in a lot of different areas. And usually the way that that gets operationalized in, in research contexts is to ensure that both men and women are included in the research, and then they compare men and women for whatever the, the outcome measure is that they're, they're of interest, and then see you know if it's higher or lower or more prevalent or less prevalent in one group or another. And that, that approach has, has been really, really important for beginning to understand the ways in which a variety of different kinds of health conditions may operate differently based on sex and gender related factors. When it comes to pain, the research is kind of all over the map in terms of what that means, what those male-female comparisons might mean in different contexts. Because the impact of sex and gender related factors is, first of all, a combination of a whole lot of different factors. It's not really just men versus women. It's, you know, what, what are the different relevant mechanisms that may be operating at different levels in men and in women and how does the how do those all interact to produce these differences in outcome so that in itself is complicated but then of course different kinds of pain are are stimulating different nervous pathways, different neurobiology, different neurotransmitters in different ways. The locations and manifestations of that pain can be quite different. So there are different, you know, some research will will show that, oh, you know, this this type of pain is more common in women than it is in men, or, or it tends to be more severe in women than it does in men. But in a fairly closely related area of pain, they may find just the opposite, or they may find no difference at all. So across the board, I would say the overall generalization from a lot of different studies is that in general, women seem to suffer more from chronic pain than men do. But there's a lot of variability in that in in different types of pain and uh, different contexts. And, And the other thing I would really want to emphasize there is a, a lot of times when we when we talk about you know men versus women in in these ways we tend to default to these sort of cultural stereotypes that we have like men are from Mars women are from Venus you know they're we are completely different from so different we're from different planets but most of the time when they do find these differences between men and women, the, the, the actual difference is, is not that big. It may be statistically significant. It may show that, yes, there is a, you know, a higher prevalence of, of certain kinds of pain in, in one gender or the other. But it's usually a matter of, of you know, a fraction of the overall burden of disease. You know, you might see a prevalence estimate of, you know, it's this kind of pain is, is present in 11% of women and only 8% of men. You know, that, that's an important difference. That's, you know, that's, that is information that we need. It's very rare. In fact, I don't know of any examples off the top of my head where we would see something that was such a striking difference that it was like, oh, men are totally different from women sort of thing. And with that, in your research too, does that look at the uh, treatment? Is that different when it comes to sex and gender as well? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's lots of interesting stuff about the treatment itself. So, I mean, there's lots of research about the mechanisms of pain and the prevalence of different pain conditions in the population. And then there's lots of research, too, that looks at different modalities for treatment of pain, uh, different medications, different physical treatments, different uh, psychological kinds of approaches and, and everything in between. And similarly, where we do see differences between males and females, they, they tend to be relatively small compared to the overall distribution. And they're very variable across modalities and across contexts. One of the things that I think is quite noteworthy and interesting about the research in this area is not so, I mean, there's lots of interesting things about the treatments themselves. But one of the things I find particularly interesting to consider is the ways that patients' pain is perceived by healthcare providers and responded to by healthcare providers. And there, there's quite a bit of evidence that healthcare provider stereotypes about people and wh- whether those stereotypes are about gender race, ability, any number of other different kinds of social categories can have a huge impact on the ways that that pain is responded to. And 
certainly when it comes to sex and gender and pain, there is a relatively strong consensus in the literature that women's pain is often taken less seriously by uh, healthcare providers and often treated less aggressively. And this probably also ties into some of those, those stereotypes, those cultural ideas about masculinity and femininity that we have. If we as a, as a society have bought into this narrative that, you know, men are tough, can handle a lot of pain and women are not as tough, then when we see someone come into the emergency department, or come into a medical office and complain about pain. There's a, a you know a likely subconscious connection that people are making that says, well, okay, you know, this is a man in front of me and he's complaining about pain and men are tough and they're not going to complain unless it's really bad. So therefore it must be really bad. And therefore, you know, I'm going to intervene in these ways. I'm not suggesting that any of this is conscious. I think the vast majority of the time it's completely unconscious and completely about these, you know, long standing socializations and narratives that we have culturally. But it's very clear in the literature that those stereotypes do have an influence on the ways that people are able to access certain kinds of care, certain kinds of interventions. The other thing too is that those norms of of masculinity and femininity can affect people's willingness to partake in certain kinds of modalities of care as well. So there's lots of literature suggesting that women are more likely to find modalities like counseling, psychological counseling, more acceptable than men are, likely having to do again with the ways that people are are, stereo, are are socialized to to think about what is legitimate and what is an acceptable expression of these kinds of things for their gender. So, you know, in, in a lot of cultural contexts, you know, it's, it's very encouraged and normalized for women to talk about their feelings and, and to, to find places to do that. Whereas a, a lot of cultural contexts discourage that among men or, or, and make it more difficult. So you, you find that, you know, women are, tend to be more likely to accept certain kinds of modalities. Another example, too, that I've, I've heard about in the context of people designing some research around veterans and veterans pain is around interventions like yoga, for example. And then in North American contexts, anyway, uh, yoga tends to be perceived as this very feminine kind of pursuit. Uh, not true in, in, yeah. in the countries and the, and the cultures where it originated, not at all. But in, in, in North American contexts, it tends to be highly feminine. And, and can therefore uh, that can affect its acceptability to to people as well. Yeah, and, and so there's a lot to unwrap there. And so what's the path forward? Is there education to the medical students as they're going through? Is there researchers are being? I guess that's what you're doing, right? Is working with researchers to to educate them. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to. I think I'm trying to hack away at it from a number of different angles. So definitely, I think um, there is an increasing amount of attention being paid to the importance of recognizing and understanding the ways that sex and gender related factors can influence different health conditions and and that that is increasingly reflected in the medical literature and in the research and in the training of of physicians and other healthcare providers as well. I mean, I myself here at the university teach a course on sex, gender, and health with that, with that exactly in mind, with the idea that if I get them early and they can take these ideas forward with them into their research or into their careers as healthcare providers, that they can use those lenses then to, to help provide better care, to do better research, to develop uh, appropriate policy. In terms of research, I want to say about 15 years ago now, not quite, uh, in Canada, the major research funder for health in Canada, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, implemented a requirement for all researchers seeking funding to talk about how they were going to incorporate sex and gender related considerations in their work. So people in Canada, researchers in Canada have been required to do that for the last 13 years. 14 years, I think. And that has really enhanced the the dialogue and, and, and the discourse around the importance of sex and gender as, as uh, influences on health. I think the, re- the big leap that we need to make next in this regard is to address sex and gender through a lens of thinking about sex and gender related factors, as opposed to thinking about sex and gender as male versus female. And, and I, I think that for a few reasons. Number one, again, I think the, the advocacy and 
the, the work done by trans communities and gender nonconformity communities in the last 10 or 15 years has amplified our, our recognition that, you know, male versus female doesn't include everybody and that we need to, to think carefully about that. But the, I think that's partly, that is partly, but not all, only why an approach thinking about sex and gender related factors is helpful. And I think it's helpful because even when we're not talking about people who exist outside these gender binary norms, the kinds of mechanisms that drive male-female difference are usually not things that are exclusively found in males versus in females. Occasionally, um, it, it can be fairly clear cut. You know, if it, we're talking about cervical cancer, for example, well, clearly yeah. you have to have a cervix <laughs> in order for that to, to be an issue. But, and, and we can, we can, you know, we can stop talking about, you know, women and service cervixes, and we can just talk about people with the cervix and, and that problem is solved. But for example, a lot of the things that we know about in, that, involve pain that involve a lot of different health conditions are things that are, aren't that neatly cut and divided between men and women. An example of a mentor of mine had done some research looking at diesel engine mechanics in, in Quebec. And most of the people who were working on these diesel engines were men, uh, but there were a few women. And of the, of the three or four women in this shop, all of them had developed a particular shoulder injury that was causing them to to be away from work. That shoulder injury did occur sometimes in men, but like like a handful of the men out of a hundred had this injury, whereas all all of the women did. And initially they speculated, uh, oh, you know, the women aren't strong enough to do this. They don't have enough upper body strength or, you know, other kinds of fairly stereotyped ideas about gender that would explain that. But when they actually went in and did some analysis, what they found is that what was happening there was about height. It was the fa- the the people who were having the shoulder injury, if, if you were tall enough and you were exerting force with your tools, you could keep your shoulder down below the level of your, your natural shoulder and exert force. Whereas if you were shorter, you had to lift your arm up higher when you were exerting force. And it was the biomechanics of that movement up above your shoulder that were causing the injury. And so what they saw then is that these women tended to be shorter. And so they were more likely to get this injury. And the short men in the shop were also fairly likely to get this injury. And so what I really, really like about this example is that it illustrates very clearly that if we were to have just assumed that it was men versus women and implemented some kind of an intervention that was like, oh, okay, you know, we're going to do this for women. We're going to do, we're, you know, we're going to take women out of the work, out of the workplace because this is, you know, too high risk for them or whatever it was going to be. We would have kind of missed the point. We, we may not have protected all of the women there, you know, a tall, I'm five feet, 10 inches tall. If I was in that shop, I probably would have not been just fine. I wouldn't have needed an intervention. And if we had just applied that intervention to women without understanding the mechanism, there are probably lots of shorter men in that shop who did need some kind of support and wouldn't have gotten it. So by paying attention to the factor itself, height, (laughs) we can actually apply an intervention that addresses the needs for everybody. Versus just taking the... uh, The male versus... The standard, yep, yep. You're weak, we're strong, there you go. You know, off you go, right? So, I mean, there's a lot here to you know, to unpack, obviously, in in this. And so, you know, we are at the end of the show, and I do appreciate uh, your thoughts on this. But that last one is an excellent example, I think, of, you know, it hits, it's perfect. I mean, it does makes it very clear is if we go in with assumptions and not look at the evidence base, then we are going to miss the mark somewhere. So I really do appreciate that uh, on your insights on, on this and and on the show. So we're going to have to wrap it up there uh, today. Thanks for being on the show. Appreciate it. My pleasure. It was a good learning experience for me. And like I said, I do like that last, uh, that last point, I think, kind of just summed that up nicely. So for our listeners, uh, if you have any feedback about the show or information on chronic pain, you can visit our website at veteranschronicpain.ca or follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Chronic Pain 
COE and then on Instagram at chronic pain underscore COE. So as I said at the start of the show, we have an offer from Dr. Pete Aratea, who is uh, well known for his podcast uh, on health and wellness. And he also has a website with lots of evidence-based information. And I've found it very helpful as a veteran over many years. So what we're going to do is people who send in questions about this show, and we do have questions coming in from our listeners, that are going to take the 10 best questions. And you're going to get a free subscription to Peter's site, which will have access to all the health information that he's providing on there and on wellness and everything. So just email us or messenger us at uh, veteranschronicpain.ca or on Facebook and Twitter at chronicpaincoe and Instagram at chronicpain underscore coe. So once again, Stacey, thanks very much for being on the show. It was great, uh, great learning experience and uh, great to have you. My pleasure, Tom. Thanks for the invitation. And to our listeners, uh, stay well. Thank you. The Most Painful Podcast is produced for the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence by Story Studio Network and Eye Contact Productions.